This is Your Superior Self, Episode 65, Reaching Beyond Your Boundaries with SEAL Team 6 retiree and New York Times bestselling author, Don Mann. So I do a lot of visualization and, and also I'll push myself to the point of passing out. So now I'll look at a big challenge, a mountain or a big race or a long, long, you know, multi-week, multi-month trip, Everest or something. And I'll look at it and I'll look at the challenge head on without being cocky. And I'll, I say, I welcome the pain. Bring it on. Anything worth doing is worth being hurt. And if it's too painful, I will simply pass out. And that's what happened with the, when I did the two Ironmans in that one day because, um, you know, it was a 4.8 mile swim, 224 mile bike ride, then a 52.4 mile run, two marathons. And when I got to done the first marathon, I was thinking, all I have left is a marathon. One marathon to go and I'm done this thing. And I'm running and I'm running and I started spitting up this green bile and coughing up what felt like a, a rib bone coming out sideways. And I was seeing all the white spots and I was, I was 45 years old doing two Ironmans one day and everything was blurry and then I passed out on the road. And I woke up seeing all the cyclists and runners going by me. And I got up and I started thinking, I better get up. I'm in a double Ironman. I better finish this thing. And I got up and finished. But it made me realize any other time in my life when I thought something was too hard or as I felt sorry for myself, everything hurt too much or something. If I ever felt like quitting, I would have been dead wrong because if something is too hard, your body will do yourself a favor and you'll pass out. What is up, Superior Nation? Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to your favorite podcast, Your Superior Self. The podcast that breeds inspiration into your body. To help get you motivated to become your superior self, I am your host, Trey Downs, and I'm I'm fired up over tonight's guest. His name is Don Mann. He is a New York Times bestselling author. He is a retired Navy SEAL Team 6 member. I have a crush on the Navy SEALs. I will admit it. I love everything about it. I wish I could be one of them, but I can't. <laughs> I can't run that far. <laughs> I could swim pretty good, but I can't run. I can ride a bike too. But I'm excited because Don, man, he is legit. He is a man's man. He is a true American hero. He he is a renowned world-class adventure competitor. If you look at his bio, it is like 10 pages long. He's done so many things. He's worked out every day for 22 years at one point in his life. He has done a, a ton of Ironmans. He's done back-to-back Ironmans two in one day, which is crazy to me. Like It's hard for me to run a mile around the block, let alone run two Ironmans in one day. His book, he sent me his novel. It is called SEAL Team 6 Hunt the Jackal. And I, I read it today. A little bit of it. I started it and I can't put it down. I'm just going to read a little bit of it to you and just see if you can uh, you know, get into it. When a senator's wife and teenage daughter are kidnapped, SEAL Team 6 leader Thomas Crocker and his men are sent to Mexico's lawless countryside where federal agents protect violent narcotics kingpins instead of hunting them down. The two women have been taken by the jackal. Oh my god. Like That is insane. Like right there you got me hooked there don um it's it's a, it's a credible an incredible interview it is a very raw interview i have nothing but respect for the service women and men of this country thank you don and for all the veterans and the active duty participants in the u.s military thank you for your service i have nothing but but respect for you guys that you guys you guys protect us every every night you protect you you protect us you you keep us safe that before we dive into the interview i just wanted to mention to you guys that this is actually the interview that gets me motivated to run i have a buddy of mine at work his name is mike mike shout out to you you know who you are but your journey your story got me started with the idea of running like outside like i've always ran on a treadmill which never really was 
a good feeling for me. It was just kind of like painful and just getting in shape and all that jazz. But outdoor running has always in, like been a a goal of mine. Uh, I, I struggle with asthma, so it's it's hard for me to get into it. But after talking to Don Mann and really talking to my buddy Mike about his journey with running, it's kind of inspired that bug inside of me to get back into it. And Don's like explanation of his his mental strength is really it really inspired me to get out there and try again with the running outside. Now it's it's tough, trust me, it is super tough for me. But I want to challenge you now to start a streak of your own, no matter what it is, and I want to know about it. So I'm doing this streak of running every day outside. I'm on day seven. I challenge you to do 30 days of something, uh, something that you may have wanted to do for a while, maybe haven't been that comfortable or confident about it. And now I'm challenging you to pull that out of you, whatever that may be, whatever goal that you may want to obtain. Maybe it's running, maybe it's health, maybe it's diet, maybe it's uh, starting something new. Who knows? Uh, but I, I challenge you to, for the next 30 days, to be consistent with whatever that challenge may be for you. And I want to know about it. I want to know if, you know, what it is, one, and, and two, if you're going to be serious about the challenge, let me know. Like, email me every day. Let me know if you do it or not. I'll hold you accountable. Um, yeah, so this episode really inspired uh, me to start a streak, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. It's, I'm seven days strong. I know that's early. I, I shouldn't be... Uh, <laughs> celebrating too much i guess right it's seven days but i'm pretty excited about it that's a long time for me so hopefully you guys will accept the challenge 30 days let's do it let me know email me every day message me every day let me know you guys can message me on the website at your superior self.com or you can check me out on instagram at t downs 80 send me a dm over there i'm on twitter at downs tray and on facebook at Trey Downs, D-O-W-N-E-S. You guys hit me up. Uh, I will get you motivated. I'll keep you in. Try to make sure that we all hit our... A little bit more about today's episode. I sit down with Don Mann. He's a retired Navy SEAL Team 6 member. He's a renowned world-class adventure competitor and New York Times bestselling author. He goes around and he gives these chats, these, these motivational speeches, and he presents a compelling and extremely motivating presentation that has inspired business leaders and professionals from all walks of life. He actually did a uh, keynote recently at the Naval Academy, and he talks about that. Don Mann knows what it takes to be a brother of these ultra-sensitive fraternities, and as a member of the SEAL Team 6, he's worked with countless covert operations operating from land, sea, and air, and facing shootings decapitation stabbings he's captured he was captured by the enemy and he lived to talk about it and he participated in highly classified missions all over the globe including somalia panama el salvador colombia afghanistan and iraq as the training coordinator for the seal has had to overcome his own troubled childhood and push his body to a breaking point and beyond at the podium and inside SEAL Team 6, he shares a high-octane narrative of physical and mental toughness, and he gives this unprecedented insight to the inner workings of the training and secret missions of the world's most respected and feared combat unit. So, without further ado, it is my pleasure, my honor to have Don Mann here for you today. Hey, what's going on, guys? I'm excited tonight because I don't know if I've ever said this on the show, but I am a huge fan of the SEAL teams. And tonight I am joined with Don Mann. He is a former Navy SEAL Team 6 commando. He's a renowned world-class adventure competitor and a New York Times bestselling author. Don, I want to say thank you and it is an honor and thank you for your service. Um, th- it's an honor to have Thanks, Trey. It's nice to be here with you. So why don't you go ahead and update us? What what are you up to today? What's going on with you? Uh, what any? I, I think you just got done with a novel or a, a book. What- well, today, the best part of the day was a two-hour paddle and a, an hour bicycle ride. Um, but as far as the writing goes, believe it or not, and I'm not like this guy who puts out a ton of books in a short period of time, but in the last 60 days, I put out three books. 
So one was uh, fiction, one was nonfiction, one was motivational. They just happen to all be coming out at the same time. Uh, the one that's motivational, and I, the one I think you might be more interested in, is called Reaching Beyond Boundaries. I've done 18 books, and of the 18 I've done, this is by far my favorite of them all. If anybody ever asked me which one to read, that's that's be the one I would read. It's, it's what I did, Trey. I just took stories from people who have really motivated me throughout my life and threw in some of my own stories, but extreme examples of things that have happened and then gleaned the lessons from it and shared the lessons. And I do these talks around the country, and, and uh, the talks are only an hour long, but the book allowed me to, um, and the talks are called the same thing, Reaching Beyond Boundaries, but the book allowed me to add a lot more depth to it. So it was by far my favorite project as far as a book goes. Who's motivated you the most? I think there's different categories. You know, as an athlete, it's Reinhold Mesner, the greatest climber of all time. And music, it's David Gilmore. And um, as politicians, it's President George Bush, 41. Um, as I, I have like different categories. Um, you know, I just have different categories. For sports, Reinhold Mesner, because the difference, I've done a th over a thousand events, um, as sporting events. And I climbed Everest two years ago, and I, I got very, very deathly ill and almost died up there. But anyways, Reinhold Mesner, he was the first to summit Everest without oxygen, first to summit it all alone. And those thousand or so races I've done, he would laugh at them. He would say, that's kid stuff. Some are 500 miles long. I just came back from Canada. I did a 750-mile event, which is on TV now. But uh, Reinhold Mesner would say, that stuff's all kid stuff. He said, what I do... I take this pack, I find a mountain that hasn't been climbed before, I tell my friends and family I should be back in a couple of months, and he'll go summit the mountain alone in the winter. That's the guy who motivates me the most, because a guy like that, really, there's nobody like him, and he's, he's considered the greatest mountaineer of all time, and now he's being considered the greatest mountaineer the world might ever know, which is a huge, huge, huge you know, title. I don't know anybody else who has that title in any other uh, profession. So he motivates me the most. What motivated you to, to join the city? My father was World War II generation, the greatest generation. Uh, they, everybody then, back in those days, they were pro-America. And they were pro, do whatever you can for God, country, family. That's what the order, my father always said, God, country, family. Uh, when World War II came about, you know, he had two brothers and a sister, all four. He quit school. They all quit and they all went off. Uh, they all came back. One was captured in prison of war for two years, but th they all made it back safely. And um, any time we'd be sitting around as little boys and girls, little kids sitting around the table. And there's a veteran who was killed. My father would tear up. And uh, any time any any um, anti-U.S. sentiment would take place, he would get upset. He joined the VFW, lifelong member, and ran the post, ran uh, disabled veterans post, ran the whole post for the whole state, and he gave his life pretty much to, to veterans. And he always instilled in us at a young age that you have to serve your country. So I always knew, even before I knew I knew, that I was going to serve my country. And I went into the Marine Corps. I didn't know anything about SEAL teams initially. And I went into the Marine Corps recruiter, and I probably found the only recruiter in the Marines who wasn't squared away. This guy just wasn't impressive. And I wanted the Marines because I wanted the physical part of it. So I figured I'll go next door to the Navy recruiter, and that guy was good. Diamond Jim Brady was his name. And he showed me a video about the SEALs. In that moment, I thought, that's it. I, I mean, you're doing pull-ups, push-ups, sit-ups, running on the beach, swimming, diving, jumping, going all over the world with the toughest guys in the world. There was nothing else I wanted in this life but that at that point. And I, my mind's never changed. And that was over 40 years ago. Well, what's the – so you go – how do you get into the SEAL teams? Like uh, just for the, the, the people that are, are unfamiliar with the, um, the protocol and, the, and the, the, how you get into – you know. In so what – if anybody's motivated enough to make it through the teams, they will find a way to get there. But it's so easy nowadays, really. You go to a recruiter, you go to your college recruiter, if you're going to 
become an officer, if you graduate college or you go to a high school recruiter, um, and you say, where, where's, where can I talk to military people? They'll send you off to the nearest recruiter. The military recruiters will lay it out for you. This is a plan to get to BUDS. It wasn't that easy when I was going through it. It took me four years to get there. Now you can sign a contract. If I pass the physical test, if I pass the screening test, which isn't that hard, if you're going to be a SEAL, it's not hard at all. If you pass that screening test, they'll send you off to BUDS. If there's a, a billet open. If there's not a billet open, they'll wait until there is a billet open. So nowadays, and they, they need more SEALs than there are people applying. And there's been times throughout the ages where SEAL teams were really hurting on people and the big Navy would try to lower the standards and they'd say, hey, instead of having to do this many push-ups or this many pull-ups or the run of the swim in these times, let's make it a little easier. The SEALs hated it. We hated that. We lowered the standards a little bit and we got less than SEAL material coming through the door. So we really still don't get all the SEALs we need. There's all these college programs and high school programs and top athletes from around the country are trying to get in. But the thing is, you get a class of 150, 175, you still graduate about 20 or so people, which is with the people retiring, getting out, getting killed, and getting wounded so they can't be on active duty anymore. Um, there's, there's, we need more good, good quality people coming through the door to be sealed still. So there, there are six teams, right? And they're spread out. Um, I think it's on the West and East Coast. Um, I think it's one, three, and is it, how does it go? Is it even number on, on the East Coast or is it odd number on the West? Uh, how does that work? On the East Coast, it matches up with aviation squadrons and the ships. They're even numbers. So two, four, eight, and ten. And SDV team, swimmer delivery vehicle team, is all East Coast. SEAL Team 6, separate from all those, and it's at a different location, but it's also on the East Coast. On the West Coast, out in Coronado, it's 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9, of course, uh, is coming too. So the reason there used to only be two SEAL teams. When I came in, there were only two SEAL teams, SEAL Team 1 and 2. I wanted to be at both. I actually I wanted to be at all teams, 1, 2, and 6. And that's where I went, one, two, and six. One and two were established for Vietnam. Uh, those were the only teams. Also, there were underwater demolition teams. And there were two underwater demolition teams on the East Coast and two on the West Coast. It was the same exact training. You go through this rigorous BUDS training, and you either go to a SEAL team or underwater demolition team. The training was just the same. Underwater demolition team did more in the water, uh, demolitions and things like that, and SEALs did more on land. Everybody wanted to be a SEAL, and we had a joke, just UDT. Or you're a SEAL at just UDT, but still the same exact quality of people. So there were one SEAL team on the West Coast, one on the East Coast. Then in uh, 83, all the UDT teams became SEAL teams. So then you had one, three, and five on the West Coast, two, four, and eight on the East Coast. What Richard Marcinko did in 1980, when there's only two teams, one and two, he wanted to confuse the Russians. He wanted an undercover, long-haired, counter-terrorist maritime team to match Delta Force, but it's undercover, covert, and we call it SEAL Team 6, so the Russians would think we had six teams. So SEAL Team 6, like you, you talked about the difference right there, but everybody knows it. Like It's famous now, right, because of Osama bin Laden. Uh, Talk about that. Like, what makes SEAL Team 6 so... Every SEAL who's in is really good, okay? Um, you go through BUDS for six months. You go through all this other training. And if you're a SEAL and you get a trident on your chest, you're proven. Now, now, you go to one of the other teams, not six. You go to any other team once you come out of BUDS. If you prove yourself, you get marks higher than your peers, you do a certain amount of deployments, you're excelling as a SEAL. After a certain amount of years, you have to be very experienced, you can request to get interviewed for SEAL Team 6. They'll look at your package. If they have any interest in you at all, they'll fly to wherever you are, and they'll come interview you. And if they like you, they pluck you right from the team, which is kind of exciting. I love Team 1. I love being part of SEAL Team 1. 
and when I was interviewed, I thought the interview went pretty well. And uh, the captain of SEAL Team 6 went up to my captain. He said, we're taking him. I was gone in two weeks. It's that fast. But it's exciting. But here's what happens. You know, you're established. You're sealed. You've been around. You're respected at, at one of the regular teams. You go to SEAL Team 6, you're a brand new guy now. You're brand new. You go through this training that's harder than BUDS in so many ways. You're brand new. You don't really speak much. You listen to all the very, very experienced veterans. You get into an assault team after what's called green team. And then gradually you build yourself back up the ranks again as someone who knows what they're doing or knows what they're talking about and someone who can lead the team. Yeah. I mean, there is a there is a difference. Um, now, when you served, were you uh, peacetime or were you did you get any action across overseas? Boy, I had the easiest career in the world. We had action. We thought we were busy with certain little things. Nothing compared to the guys nowadays. Nothing. There's no comparison. Um, I came in in 77 and got out in 98. All the action started in 2001. So we thought we were busy, you know, with conflicts here and there. None of them. Multi-day things at the most. We were gone 300 days a year, and everyone looked at us like, my God, you guys are getting all the action. In hindsight, there is nothing compared to, you know, we used to joke about it when 9-11 uh, came about and guys were getting out of buds and going to the SEAL teams. A year afterwards, they'd have a rack of medals this high, this big on the chest, more than a lot of guys had in 20 years in the military. So it's all about the timing. I, I felt guilty because my I had it so easy. Well, talk about that, right? You, you say you feel guilty. A lot of people, especially like, all right, so... I listen to Jocko Willink and some of the stories he reads, the books that he and the guests that he have on. Um, it, it's kind of like a common theme. Whenever like someone gets hurt or comes over, when whenever there's wartime going on and they can't be with their brothers, they feel guilty because they feel like they, they left them there. Um, can you talk about that? Like, what is that? The, the story that you know, and I know, and Jocko knows, all everybody knows it. The extreme example of what you're just saying, I don't think it could be told any better than what Marcus is going through right now, Marcus Luttrell, because that guy, good guy, you know, he went through buds, him and his brother, he's a corpsman, you know, they got captured up on the hill, well, they got caught up on the hill, and he's with three good teammates, Mike Murphy, his best friend, and um, and before you know it, they get caught, and they get in a firefight, and they get falling down the mountain, all that stuff, but then he loses three friends of his, and he sees basically all three of them die, pretty much. And then he gets captured, and then a helicopter gets shot out of the sky, and they're all killed. And then the villagers who saved him, a lot of them died. So imagine, I always think about Marcus, always thinking about the survivor's guilt he must have. And he's struggling. You know, he's struggling. Um, so for him, he's probably, I, I can't say what's in his brain, but a person like that who saw all this, and then he went back on active duty after all that happened. But to see all that and wonder, boy, look at all those people killed because of me. What? What? I'm no, I'm nobody before this happened. What the heck's going on here? So I, I, I can imagine one person being killed because of you, but all of those people. And I've talked to a lot of those families of the, the fallen during all that. It was the hardest thing I ever did when you know, as far as going around the country talking to people. They, they they can't explain it, and they, they, they're living with it, and they're thinking, why did we all die? I mean, why did they all die? Why did they all die? But Marcus has to live with it, and um, I don't know a better example than that. But the bond the bond that you guys build over in training and just being around one another f every day, uh, sometimes that bond can be stronger than family. Sometimes that bond can be stronger than husband and wife. Can you explain that? They last longer than husband and wife a lot of times. You know, a lot of guys divorce two, three, four. I know one guy's six divorces now. Um, a lot of times the bonds last longer than a husband and wife a lot of times. But also, you know, everyone says, oh, I'm a family man. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love being home. But if you're home 30 days a year or 60 days a year and you're gone 300 days a year, and I'll say, I'll speak for myself. I didn't like being home. I just liked being with the guys. And um, and when I got home, I got really bored and couldn't wait to get back out with the guys. 
And uh, it's, it's kind of sad because it destroys marriages and destroys families. But then again, if you can look past that, which you can't all the way, but if you can look past that a little bit, that's what you want people going into war with. People who want nothing else but to be with the guys and do anything for the guys. It's really what you want. You don't want people thinking, oh, man, I'm really missing my wife and kids. I wish I was home. You cannot, you can't have too much a degree of that. What was your um, your final rank when you retired? Uh, CW03, Chief Warrant Officer. So, um, in that leadership position, uh, what did those um, what did those duties entail? Well, uh, when I retired, I was the Advanced Training Officer at SEAL Team Six, and I was also the Weapons of Mass Destruction Officer at SEAL Team Six. That was a big thing back then. Weapons of mass destruction, if you remember, you know, going into Afghanistan, Iraq, looking all, looking all these countries, looking for weapons of mass destruction. Um, it was mainly Iraq. I said Afghanistan, but it was Iraq and neighboring countries. But that was the two things I was doing. And prior to that, I was an assault team leader, a boat crew leader in an assault team at SEAL Team 6. So leadership is – your leadership role was was – very important. It, it's very important to run a um, to run a mission. It's very important to have your men respect you. Like, how do you earn that respect among men? I mean, you guys are like you guys are like the manliest guys that I know. Uh, how do you earn that respect from these rugged ass dudes? These guys that are just warriors. Like, how do you earn that respect? Well, you don't get it with rank at all. It doesn't. Nobody cares what rank you are. You get it by living and working and, and the commitment and the sacrifice you're willing to put out, how hard you put out, how, how you are for the mission and for the team and for your teammates, not for your own rank and your own personal motivation, whatever that happens to be. It comes clear on who is around you and why they're there and how much they're willing to commit. Everybody's willing to commit. To go to war and all that there are some who can't wait to go and others might say ah, let's hold off on this there are different levels everybody wants to go but those who will give anything for their team and their teammates that that attitude and those behaviors um you'll they're recognizable easily recognizable because you're with the guys all the time you're with the guys all the time so you 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 can't fake that. People will see it or they won't see it. And if they see it, that's the type of guy they want to be led by or that's the type of guy they'll follow. Who's who's your favorite leader in the military? Like who is the, the, the past? Let's think about World War II. Like who's your favorite general? I love Patton. MacArthur. What, uh, what made Patton such a great leader? Let me see. Patton had, he, he wasn't, um, he didn't do anything to impress his superiors. He didn't do anything to be, I hate to use this term, politically correct. He did everything. He was brilliant, for one, a brilliant mind. And he, he just did things, mission first, focus on the mission, take care of the men, period. There was nothing else about him other than you want to go to war, this is the guy we want to lead us. Pat and MacArthur, I mean um, – you know, go back to Civil War. Uh, that's the attitude. I just spoke at the Naval Academy last week, and I told these guys, I said, uh, you know, I've worked with some great leaders in the past, and a lot of them have come out of this place, Naval, U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, Marines, you know, colonels, generals, Navy captains and admirals. And the difference is a lot of them are fantastic. And those guys, you knew their heart was all about mission focus, focusing on the mission, the objective, the men. I've also worked with some really terrible officers that came out of the Naval Academy, some Marines, some Navy guys, commanders. And the reason they were terrible is because their motivation was, I better be good to this guy. I better be around the flagpole. How can I impress the boss? I've got two stripes. I want three stripes. Where am I going to go for my next promotion? It was all about them. And that's very apparent. And it's so easy to see. When we got an officer like that, 
if we got one like that and we had a few that were bordering that, we did things and got rid of them and, and things they wouldn't want to say on the camera. Well, give like, can you give one mild example? I'd rather not. Maybe someday we'll have it somewhere together. I mean, they were, they were bad. They were bad. If we, if we saw an officer that, okay, I'll, I'll give you an example that wasn't terrible. Okay, we had an officer. We didn't care for the guy at all. And we thought he was going to get us killed. And um, so uh, we, we brought him out to a bar. And um, we brought him to this bar. And I, I was the one who told the, uh, the waitress, I said, we're all going to order drinks. And when we do, we want water. But give that guy over there a double shot of tequila or vodka or something. Every time anybody orders a drink, give all of us water. So anyways, before you know it, this guy's plastered. He was our leader. We walked outside. He fell down. And he broke his arm. Oh, wow. Um, we had him at that point. That's the mild story. The others make that just seem like nothing. But we would, we would find ways to get rid of the officers that we didn't feel we wanted around us. I, I would be wrong by saying anything more than that. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm looking at your bio here, and one of the bullet points says that you have worked out every day for 22 years. Do you still work out every day? No. Um, I try to work out 10 hours a week outdoors. I probably could answer that by saying yes, but if something happens and I'm traveling something, I don't work out, I'm okay with that. So I don't have a streak anymore. I broke that streak, but it went over 21 years without a day off. And, um, and that's seven days. Oh yeah. Seven days a week. And, and I was obs beyond obsessed. Uh, Friday I would start the workout right after work and I'd be dropped off in the woods. It might be a 50 mile hike to my bicycle, a hundred mile mountain bike ride to the cliffs, Jumar climb up the cliffs and then a, maybe a 40 mile whitewater paddle. I'd be finished the workout Monday morning, then go to work. That's what I did on weekends. Holy crap. Yeah, and I did, you know, I did two Ironmans in one day. My, 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 the thing I liked the most were the 500 and 600 mile nonstop adventure races in places like the Himalayas, Nepal, Tibet, Ecuador, South Africa, Lesotho, Africa, Alaska, the extreme places and climbing mountains, the 20,000 footers. I like, I, you know, I like pushing myself hard and, um, you know, I've hurt myself a few times. Right now, I'm on a that brigade. It's on TV now. It's on every Monday night, and that was a 750 mile paddle I did with nine other people. We got chosen for this reality TV show. I think I was older than all their parents were, and uh, they said, and they asked me if I wanted to be on the show. I said, "Do you know I'm 60 years old?" But when I said that, I knew for sure I could do a 750 mile paddle. This was in August, so my mind is strong. It's very, very strong. It's way stronger than my body is. My body, I've, I've got all these, you know, things that are broken down in my body. But, you know, I'm a multi-sport athlete. So if I can't climb, I'll run. If I can't run, I'll bike. If I can't bike, I'll paddle. I'll always do something. I try to spend 10 hours a week outdoors just on the regular work week. And then I lift weights, you know. But um, I love, I, I really believe it's so good for your mind and your body. And I just, we just had a Navy reunion here this uh, weekend. Actually, it's supposed to be the weekend, but it went on for six days. <laughs> People came early and left late. <laughs> and the, the guys who didn't work out all these years, they just all started falling to pieces. You know, and I just, uh, it's, I just lucked out as a young guy. I found it fun and exciting to push myself hard. I didn't really realize the long-term effects would be so helpful. You know, I've got physical injuries, but as far as having the mindset, like if somebody said, Let's go do a hundred mile jog right now. I'd feel confident I could do it, or a hundred mile paddle, or whatever it is. I just have that my, and it's not always good because I know my mind will get my body in trouble, which it's done many, many times. But I just know there's nothing impossible to do. Mm. Well, you say that you know your mind is strong. Um, like, are there moments when you're out there working out or? Maybe not now, but before when you're doing uh, all these events, like, did you ever want to quit? Like, did you ever like mentally want to stop 
racing and because of the pain or the the suffering that you were enduring i never wanted to quit no nope now in buds buds was not easy there wasn't anything easy about it but i will say i did visualization for four years getting ready for buds and i pictured what every day was going to be like as best i could and every day i got back to the barracks while i was in buds i was thinking that was a hard day but not as hard as i thought it would be so i do a lot of visualization and and also i'll push myself to the point of passing out so now i'll look at a big challenge a mountain or a big race or a long, long, you know, multi-week, multi-month trip, Everest or something. And I'll look at it, and I'll look at the challenge head on without being cocky, and I'll, I say, I welcome the pain. Bring it on. Anything worth doing is worth being hurt. And if it's too painful, I will simply pass out. And that's what happened with the, when I did the two Ironmans in that one day because um, – you know, it was a 4.8 mile swim, 224 mile bike ride, then a 52.4 mile run, two marathons. And when I got to done the first marathon, I was thinking, all I have left is a marathon. One marathon to go and I'm done this thing. And I'm running and I'm running. And I started spitting up this green bile and coughing up what felt like a, a rib bone coming out sideways. And I was seeing all the white spots. And I was, I was 45 years old doing two Ironmans one day. And everything was blurry. And then I passed out on the road. And I woke up seeing all the cyclists and runners going by me. And I got up and I started thinking, I better get up. I'm in a double Ironman. I better finish this thing. And I got up and finished. But it made me realize any other time in my life when I thought something was too hard or as I felt sorry for myself, everything hurt too much or something. If I ever felt like quitting, I would have been dead wrong because if something is too hard, your body will do yourself a favor and you'll pass out. And you get the break you need, then you get up and finish. And if you quit before that, you quit and you still had something left inside. So that, when I go around doing talks, that's what I talk about. And you could be a banker, you could be a piano player, you can be a janitor. It doesn't matter what you are. You could pick a goal, pick a high, far-reaching goal, what I call the macro goal, and find a lot of micro goals. Meet those little micro goals. Before you know it, you're going to achieve that macro goal. Then bring the macro goal down a level, use it as a micro goal so the next macro goal can be bigger. And that's what I did using the triathlon set as an example. At one point, my macro goal, I just wanted to do a marathon. Once I did that, I brought it down, next macro goal. I just wanted to do two marathons in one day. I did that, brought it down. I want to do an Ironman. Did that, brought it down. I want to do a double Ironman, two Ironmans. And it just, and then those macro goals now become micro goals and you have to do that to get to the next macro goal. And then that list of accomplishments, your life accomplishments, gets long. It gets long and longer and longer. Do you ever watch um, uh, David Goggins at all? No, I know who he is. Yeah, we have similar backgrounds. No, I, 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 I hear about him all the time. Um, we have similar backgrounds. I don't know him. I've never met him. Do you know Jocko at all? Jocko Willink? Nope, never met him either. No. Well, David Goggins, like you're explaining these things and he, of course he's on Instagram and he does all these, uh, marathons like you're, you're discussing like, all right. So I'm not saying that a normal guy can't do it, but it seems like, I mean, I mean me, like I've always struggled with asthma or whatever. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I didn't go into the services. But, um, when I hear of these marathons that you've completed and, and, I mean, back to back, like, that's crazy to me. Like, I think like the average Joe, the average Trey, like when we, when we get into high pressure situations, when we get into these tough, difficult life situations, it's probably easier for us to kind of like think about giving up, but a man like you, a warrior like you who has been through the hardest, hardest of the hard training, like it's, it's, it's harder for you. I mean, you're ready, You're willing to pass out, right? You're willing to go run two marathons in one day where the average guy is like, you know, I'm lucky if I can run two miles. Right. But that mental toughness that you talk about, is that something that you can teach? Yep. I have to try, if you don't mind, I have to disagree with a couple of things you said too. Sure. Sure. Um, I, I would say, and no disrespect or anything, 
I am positive if you wanted to do two marathons today, you could. It would just be painful and it would hurt and you'd have to take your medicine and things like that. It, you could do it. Like what would stop you from putting one foot in front of the other? As long as your mind said, I can do it. If it gets too much, you pass out, you get up and you keep going, go slow. But you could do it if you wanted to. Okay, so, you know, I talk about doing those two Ironmans. Really, that's a small feat in some people's minds because a lot of people have done three. Some have done five. A handful have done ten. And just a couple of years ago in Italy, they had 30 back-to-back Ironmans. Wow, 30 and th- 30. One, one a day. One a day for 30 days, yep. Yeah. But it used to be the biggest thing in the world. Like, oh, my God, I'm going to do one of these this year. And then you're like, oh, wow, that year, I'm so glad I'm done with that. Now they're doing one a day. So people like you and people like me and people like people we know, really, if they put their mind to anything, they could. Now, you have the asthma, you said, but that's that won't stop you. It could hinder you a little bit. But um, And I know you work out. I can tell you work out. So you definitely stay in shape. But, you know, I did 30 in 36 months, 30 marathons. I got bored of them, really, after a point, 26 mile running on the pavement. It's only so much fun. And then I started doing the 50 milers and the longer ones and the adventure races. But um, they're nice stepping stones, you know, do a 5K to get to the 10K, do the 10K to get the marathon, get the marathon to do the double marathon, do the double marathon to get to the Ironman. And I just like use them as stepping stones. Because at one point in my life, a marathon was, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm going to run 26.2 miles. But once you do it, just bring it back down and go for something bigger. And it doesn't have to be in sports. It could be in broadcast. It could be in radio. It could be blog sites. It could be in writing. It could be in anything. But just look at something big and then a lot of smaller things that will help you get to that big goal, regardless of who the person is. So that was the thing I wanted to say. I just didn't agree with you on but as far as teaching the stuff, that is what I do for work, basically. I just take people out team building things or or I do talks for people. And uh, and that's pretty much what I do now for work. It's, it's my passion. I love doing it. So how did you get into to writing books? Like did somebody say, hey, look, you have all this leadership ability. You have all these leadership experiences. Like you need to start writing about this or what? how that – how did you – It was nothing like that. It was um, – And I wasn't a good student at all either. And I hated English and writing. I didn't like that stuff at all. And I don't like being on a computer. So I don't like anything about that whole process. But um, when I was doing the adventure races, I was up at the high level competing. And I was producing them at a high level. And I had an adventure racing academy, the first in North America. And I had a politician come up to me one day. And he said, Don, you're the only one we know that teaches it, produces them, and competes. Why don't you write a book on adventure racing? I said, I don't want to write a book. He said, why not? I said, because I don't want to be sitting behind a computer writing a book. He said, I'll write it. You just put it on tape. So I just talked on a tape. I had my notes. I knew what I was talking about. I sent it to him. So that was my first book. And then I was working for the U.S. government, teaching weapons and tactics, and um, and I had a lot of material, you know, being a SEAL instructor and being a government instructor. And um, and then my boss said to me, he says, Don, you got to write a book. You got a lot of shooting material. I said, Jimmy, I don't want to write a book. He goes, go ahead, write a book. You got all the material right in front of you. So I put it into chapters and in, um, shotgun, long gun and handgun. And then um, the, the publisher said, yeah, we like this stuff, but it's way too much. We have way too much here. Can you give us about a third of that? So I got rid of the long gun and shotgun stuff. And then I wrote a shooting book. And then I started thinking about the movie Forrest Gump. And my mother had passed away. And I was thinking that my mother and I both liked that movie so much. And then um, I was thinking, really, that was just a fictional character. And he brought us through real life history with Vietnam and Watergate and Nixon and Johnson and Kennedy and ping pong. But he gave us a history lesson with a fictional character. I started thinking, boy, that'd be a nice way to give a history lesson to today's people using a seal with Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Colombia. And so I talked to a co-writer. He loved the idea, and we did eight of those books. 
So it's been going. And then a publisher called me. They said, the Air Force has a survival manual. The Army has one. The Marines have one. Why don't you write one? I said, I don't want to write another book. They said, come on. We'll pay you up front. We'll give you a year to do it. So I did that one. So it's just, uh, it's been like that for 18 books now. And um, it's been fun, I have to admit. But the last one I did, The Reaching Beyond Boundaries, that was my favorite. That's the thing I do the talks on because that was like we started doing with this conversation you and I have. And um, I got to interview and talk to a, some big, big people in my mind uh, who really impressed me my whole life. And they, they contributed quite a bit to it. And I just put their stories in there a lot. And it's a talk I do, but the talk's only an hour long. This allowed me to go much further than just that talk. The the cool thing that you do is that you can you can take the physical aspects of life and you can kind of convert that into teaching moments for everything else in life too, right? So all the physical um, hardships that you had to endure with the races and Marines and the training and that transfers over to to everything else in life, right? I mean that. I think so. I think it does. The mental preparedness, the the ability to push through uh, that runner's wall, the uh, the pushing yourself, picking yourself up when you pass out, uh, just the this ability not to to quit. It's such a great life. life. Yeah, Trey. Um, I'm glad I didn't only get the fun out of it or the misery, whatever it is. I am fortunate that I was able to take lessons from a lot of it. And then that's what I do now with books and speaking is share those lessons. How can people connect with you? Um, well, I guess by email would be an easy way. Um, I have a website that's uh, www.usfrogman, like my last name, F-R-O-G-M-A-N-N.com. But if you Google my name, that website will probably show up anyways. And usually it's by email, a website, you know, connection through email. So remind us, why do they call seals frogs? <laughs> well, frogs live in the water and they can go up on land and they can do whatever they do on land and jump out in the water and swim for long periods of time. And the fins, you know, the feet look like fins. And yeah, so that's that's the early day frogmen were seals. You don't hear it so much anymore. Sometimes Navy divers are called frogmen. But it's seals to call frogmen. And in, in, in the teams, you call each other frogs, even. They have a bunch of frogs that coming down to the bar. And, yeah. That's awesome. Well, Don, I want to say, I want to respect your time. Um, I, I want to say thank you for coming on. And I want to ask you one last question or, and get your advice on something. So, a lot, a lot of the people that I interview and people that I talk to throughout uh, my day, we, we talk often about the meaning of life. Um, and I changed my, my mental uh, attitude towards that. And I'm trying to um, look at it more. So what my meaning to life is, right? Instead of saying, what is the meaning of life? I want to say, what or ask, what is my meaning to life? What am I going to bring to life? What value am I going to bring? And so I ask you that question. At the end of the day, what value and how do you look at the, the, the meaning that you're bringing to life? I would say early on in life, I brought zero value, <laughs> probably just trouble and misery to people, and then um, started growing out of that a little bit, and then started neutralizing, so I wasn't causing problems, but not adding any real value to anybody's life, and then through a little bit more maturity and life lessons and all, um, started really realizing what's right and wrong, and how to treat people and how to how to um, maybe learn from mistakes and share those mistakes in a way that um, other people will get it. Um, why have other people make the same mistakes you've made if you can say something in some way to prevent someone else from doing it? And on the same hand, not only mistakes, but on the same hand, advice. If something that worked for me at one point in my life and worked more than once and maybe a couple times and to share that lesson with people saying, you know, this really worked for me. I'm not saying to do this, but boy, I tell you what, this is what worked for me. And the older I get, the more I like doing that. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to say sound sadistic or anything, but if it all ended for me tomorrow, I'd be fine with that. But in the meantime, 
I just want to, um, you know, try not to do anything wrong and try to only bring value and, and happiness and good to people around me. That's awesome, man. Well, I want to say thank you for joining the show. It has been an honor. And again, thank you for your service. I want to say thank you to Don Mann for hanging out and taking the time to come on the show and talk to us today. I want to thank you, the listener, for downloading and hanging out. And I really enjoy interacting with you guys. So hit me up on Instagram at tdowns80, on Twitter at Downs Trey, Facebook at Trey Downs, D O W N E S. Send me some messages. Let me know the feedback that you want to provide about the show and get after it. Keep crushing your goals. Go after your goals. Create a goal. Again, 30-day challenge. I challenge you to do something consistent for 30 days. No matter what, I want to know about it. I want to help you succeed. So send me your goals. Let me know how you guys are doing, and I'll talk to you guys later.